Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to our Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, before we get started, I want to give thanks to our exhibitors who make this uh, program possible. Uh, today, we have two sponsors. I want to uh, send a shout out to uh, Janssen Pharmaceutical, as well as Pfizer. For those that are in person, please go ahead and visit the exhibit hall uh, to spend a little time with our sponsors. Uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce to everybody uh, Elliot Stevenson. So Elliot was born and raised in Minneapolis, uh, spent his uh, young, uh, younger years here. Uh, he made his first attempt to leave uh, Minneapolis uh, when he went down to Washington University in St. Louis for a biomedical engineering uh, degree. Uh, and then uh, following a couple of cross-related uh, trauma, surgeries, incidents, uh, he decided to pursue uh, medicine and came back to uh, University of Minnesota where he completed medical school. Uh, and then he uh, made another attempt uh, to leave the, the area. Uh, at that point, he couples matched with his now current wife uh, and actually spent several years out in Oregon. Uh, but the lure of the winters, uh, the disappointments of the football and the baseball team brought him back. Uh, and he's uh, joined the practice here uh, for several years now. For the past few years, uh, he's not only become an integral part of our uh, vascular surgical programs, he's also accumulated uh, three children as well as a dog more recently. So uh, it is absolutely my pleasure here to introduce Dr. Stevenson, who's going to spend a little bit of time talking to us about the management of superficial venous disease. Thank you, Dr. Jim. Uh, and uh, this is a let's make sure happy Pi Day, everybody. If uh, <laughs> for the math nerds, uh, so I have uh, no financial disclosures. Uh, I would like to acknowledge uh, Drs. Uh, Alden, Alexander, and uh, Dr. Skake uh, for uh, their assistance with this presentation. Uh, although some were more uh, uh, more assistance than others, this is a slide I took from Dr. Alexander's presentation on veins. I have no idea what this means. There's no words, it's just this. Uh, so for vein disease, a fair amount of, I think some of the difficulty of it, there's a lot of different sort of terminology that's sometimes synonymous and sometimes not. Uh, so we'll talk a little about uh, going through the terminology as well as the anatomy, then uh, pathophysiology, epidemiology, and get to management, as well as some results. Uh, so the the Varicose veins are uh, common. Uh, most people know them when they see them, but uh, in medical definitions, three millimeters is really the, the key uh, cutoff, and particularly for uh, insurance approval, uh, three millimeters really is kind of the, I don't know, the, the, the magic number. Uh, reticular veins um, are smaller veins, uh, but still dilated. Uh, by definition, one to three millimeters, and then telangiectasias are uh, are often talked about spider veins or broken veins, and these are less than one millimeter in diameter. Uh, superficial venous system versus the deep venous system. Uh, the, the the fascia is the uh, dividing, uh, so the the fascia that invests the muscles is what differentiates the deep venous system from the superficial venous system. The superficial veins run inside the between the skin and the uh, fascia. And there's uh, also perforating veins, uh, which are connection points between the superficial venous system and the deep venous system. And the deep venous system is the majority of the venous return to the, the heart. Uh, so removal of the superficial veins does not worsen uh, the hemodynamics uh, of the lower leg, assuming the, uh, the superficial veins that you're removing are not uh, working right. And so uh, truncal veins are basically the, the source of a lot of the varicose veins in the lower extremity. And the three main ones uh, that we see most commonly are the, really the great saphenous vein, which runs uh, from its confluence with the uh, common femoral vein uh, at the saphenofemoral junction down to the uh, ankle on the medial aspect. It's, uh, uh, this uh, illustration uh, shows some varicose veins arising from this. There's also an anterior accessory saphenous vein, which arises uh, usually just after the saphenofemoral junction runs along the anterior border of the leg. Uh, and some, this is sometimes uh, talked about as an anterior lateral tributary. Uh, I've stopped using that term because it seems that insurance will not cover treatment of that vein, but will cover anterior accessory saphenous vein treatment. Uh, the small saphenous vein is uh, on the posterior aspect of the lower leg. It uh, confluence with the popliteal vein at the saphenopopliteal junction. Uh, the majority of patients, however, some patients, it runs 
along the posterior aspect of the leg and uh, drains into the saphenous vein, uh, which is the term of vein of Giacomini. So the venous uh, uh, hemodynamics, really the, the flow should be unidirectional, and uh, what leads to venous pressure, if uh, a patient is supine, um, there really should not be much venous pressure. Uh, however, when people are standing, as I am, uh, there's a large uh, source of blood, uh, sorry, a large column of blood from my heart basically down to my uh, feet, which is uh, the source of hydrostatic pressure. And there are valves in place to break this large column of blood into smaller columns of blood to offset the pressure. So venous hypertension really is what leads to most of the problems we're going to discuss. Uh, and again, the, there's some different reasons for possible venous hypertension, and often patients have multiple of these. Uh, either deep venous thrombosis or supervenous, superficial venous thrombosis can cause obstruction of the vein. Uh, additionally, venous compression uh, can cause uh, uh, increased pressures or uh, history of venous injury. Venous incompetence, where the valves are no longer working right, and then uh, failure of the calf pump, which is either immobility or paralysis. The, the calf pump is basically uh, a system to help bring blood back to the heart, and the calf muscles, when they contract, help squeeze uh, some uh, dilated veins and push the blood back toward the heart. These are uh, just a picture of the valves in the veins, uh, or sort of a cartoon of the valves in the veins. I have a picture next. But uh, again, these are uh, bileaflet, very small, fine-looking structures, uh, but they uh, really provide a lot of uh, strength. Uh, this is a picture of a, a vein uh, with the valves. Uh, again, they look uh, really, uh, you know, in person, they don't really look like much, but if you you know, pull them, or sometimes with, when we use these uh, veins for bypass, we do them in a non-reverse configuration, and we have to remove the valves with a valvular tome. They're actually relatively uh, strong uh, and, you know, relatively impressive for how uh, small and translucent they are. Again, the flow being unidirectional, uh, but if the valves are not working, then there could be either, uh, there's retrograde flow, uh, and this leads to increased pressure, which often over time can lead to dilation of the veins, which then has worse valve function. And uh, the veins often both uh, dilate in diameter, but also elongate. So you end up with these tortuous uh, structures. This is uh, sort of how venous hypertension then leads to inflammation. Uh, this cartoon is you know, as a, there's a lot of uh, areas where this, the science of this is not as well understood, but essentially venous hypertension leads to dilation, valve distortion, and there's just a lot of feedback which ends up leading to inflammation, and then inflammation then can lead to skin changes, which can lead to ulceration. And so what starts out as just a problem with some veins uh, eventually can become uh, a, uh, a wound problem or a skin problem. Uh, so veins, uh, varicose veins are common. I've uh, unfortunately noticed that I'm developing uh, a varicose vein, uh, so Dr. Skake, I might have to come to your office soon. Uh, but uh, this is a, a study out of Scotland. They found 40% of men uh, in this study had varicose veins and 32% of women. This is a study from the United States. Uh, this was faculty or uh, employees, I guess I should say, at, at uh, San Diego. And they found that the overall incidence of varicose veins was 24%. Uh, telangiectasias was 51%, and then skin changes 6.3%. And again, as, as uh, there's increased incidence with age, and uh, there's some differences among uh, different ethnic groups. So again, these are common. Uh, you know somewhere between 20 and 40 percent of people having them, so you'll, you'll probably encounter them fairly frequently. Uh, you know, I think most people know about varicose veins, so it's, uh, it's you know, they, they frequently will ask about them. Uh, they, but you know, really a lot of the history is uh, somewhat of, if there's any previous vein injuries, uh, 
DVT, any other um, issues with uh, family history with varicose veins. Uh, these frequently do uh, run in families. Uh, then physical exam, uh, and then uh, again, a lot of the the diagnosis was really a physical exam. You know, do they have varicose veins? If they have varicose veins, it's you know you don't really necessarily need diagnostic imaging. However, the diagnostic imaging really helps better uh, understand why they have the varicose veins, where the varicose veins are coming from, and if they need treatment, what to do about it. And so besides uh, ultrasound, uh, air plethysmography, sorry, that's a hard word, uh, CT venogram, and then venogram with or without uh, intravascular ultrasound is also potentially helpful. So these are just some of the uh, symptoms that patients will complain of. Uh, so it's usually discomfort. Uh, pain is frequently uh, more mild to moderate uh, pain. It's not a severe pain in general. And again, most of these symptoms are frequently present for months to years to even decades before uh, people seek treatment, uh, an aching, fullness, swelling, burning. Uh, itching, heaviness, uh, cramping, you know, a lot of, lot of different things. And uh, again, sometimes people describe restless legs, um, tingling, uh, tiredness. There's just a, a numerous number of uh, symptoms. Uh, in general, uh, increased activity or increased dependency, uh, you know, are going to make the symptoms worse. Uh, also, patients seem to report that hot weather uh, usually makes them worse. And then uh, exercise elevation and compression seem to improve symptoms in general, although this is not uh, by any means absolute. So I, I think uh, since uh, Dr. Manetta was my uh, mentor out in Oregon, I, I'd be, uh, be in trouble if I didn't talk about the SEEP scoring system, uh, which was uh, which he and Dr. Porter um, uh, sort of uh, helped uh, create. Uh, this is the sort of the clinical classification, uh, which again is starts in C1, which is telangiectasias, and it sort of should be a progression. So C2 is varicose veins, C3 is edema, C4 is skin changes uh, uh, with pigmentation, uh, C5 being um, a healed ulcer, and then C, C class C6 is uh, a venous ulcer. So it's a little confusing because 6 is... Sort of, I don't know, I always think the healed ulcer should be six and the venous ulcer should be five, but it's this way. And again, the other part of the SEEP classification is really this idea of uh, really different, you're trying to classify patients. Uh, and so again, we don't use, or at least I tend not to use this a lot, but the etiology, which is either congenital, primary, or secondary, and then the anatomic issue, is it superficial, perforated, or deep, and then pathophysiology, reflux, or obstructive or combined. And so, again, uh, a lot of the patients we're going to be talking to and, you know, talking about varicose veins and superficial veins are going to be superficial, possibly some perforating veins, and most of the time it's going to be reflux and primary, uh, sometimes secondary. Uh, but again, the, this, the, the, the eti etiology and anatomic pathophysiology seem to be uh, at least in my opinion, less clinically important uh, on a given day um, and sort of more for research. Um, uh, C4 sometimes is broken into different uh, subsets. Uh, so there's pigmentation and eczema, which is C4A, and then lipidermatous sclerosis or atrophic blanche. But I uh, never was good at dermatology. Uh, all skin looks, you know, it's hard for me to separate these. And so I tend to just refer to it as uh, venous stasis, skin changes, as opposed to trying to really differentiate, as sometimes they have multiple, uh, is it pigmentation, is it eczema, lipidermatous sclerosis, um, and then lastly, uh, venous ulcers. Most commonly, this is uh, seen on the, uh, the distal lower leg, um, and it's uh, frequently more common in the medial uh, lower leg, uh, near the medial malleolus, although it can be on the lateral aspect. Uh, it's Full thickness, ulceration, uh, these are almost always painful uh, and, uh, and quite frequently very painful, and they're slow to non-healing. So ultrasound is really the best, uh, the best initial test. Again, 
the majority of the venous disease we're going to be seeing is uh, primary superficial and reflux uh, in terms of uh, its etiology. Uh, but if there's concern for sort of a more proximal problem, either obstruction or a potentially a proximal source, uh, which again will not be well seen with a lower extremity ultrasound, uh, then CT venogram um, or potentially a diagnostic venography uh, can be useful. The venous insufficiency ultrasound is, I think this is sometimes confusing because uh, patients often come to clinic with a, a lower extremity uh, venous ultrasound. But usually this is a study to look for uh, DVT, and it's not a functional study. So the, uh, the, func the DVT study involves compression of veins at different points and evaluating patency. Um, the venous insufficiency ultrasound is basically looking at the flow, and so this is optimally done in a standing position, uh, although sometimes that's challenging due to the patient issues, so sometimes a tilt table or some, somehow getting the leg in a dependent state. And then uh, a pressure cuff is inflated in the lower uh, 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 part of, below where you're uh, sampling, uh, which forces the blood uh, towards the head. And then there's uh, the ultrasound measures the reflux present, uh, and that's measured in it. Uh, the reflux is measured in time, so how long that blood flow refluxes backwards. That time is then used, uh, and again, uh, the pathologic, or sort of what, what is considered, considered normal is less than uh, 500, micro, uh, sorry, 500 milliseconds, or half a second. If anything longer than that is thought to be pathologic. Um, so CT venogram, uh, this again is if you don't see much in the, if the uh, lower extremity ultrasound doesn't demonstrate a lot of obvious source for the varicose veins. Uh, this is when I tend to get a CT venogram. Uh, this gives you a good look at the central uh, venous system. Uh, allows for uh, looking at if there's occlusions, from, maybe from a prior DVT, uh, if there's May Thurner anatomy, which is a compression of the left common iliac vein between the right common iliac artery and the vertebral body any other venous anomalies. Additionally, uh, sometimes you'll see pelvic varicosities, uh, and uh, these often come from uh, large gonadal veins, uh, but this will be uh, the best, I think, initial way to image this. Um, venography can be performed after this, again, especially for something like May Thurner anatomy. Uh, sometimes the the two-dimensional uh, imaging does not give you great uh, anatomy, and so therefore uh, intravascular ultrasound really can be helpful in terms of uh, determining this. But moving on uh, somewhat to management now, uh, uh, the, the conservative measures really uh, are compression, elevation, exercise, uh, weight loss, uh, some horse chestnut extracts, and then NSAIDs. Uh, and the, then we'll get on to procedural interventions. Compression <clears throat> is uh, usually, uh, for most commonly in practice, uh, used uh, with uh, graduate compression stockings. There are different uh, options and uh, sizes available. These provide external compression, uh, but only when they're being used. Uh, there's uh, good evidence that compression helps with uh, wound healing. Uh, there's some evidence that uh, it prevents uh, ulcer recurrence, but really weak evidence for other use. Um, and this is, the, uh, this is the 2011 Cochrane Review, and they talk about insufficient high-quality evidence to determine whether or not compression stockings are effective as the sole initial treatment of varicose veins people without healed or active ulceration. And again, this is, you know, partly limited by data. Uh, and you know, for something as common as veins, you'd think there'd be potentially more data. There's, uh, fortunately, sometimes the data in, in the vein world is not, not great. Um, and the, although most, uh, a lot of times patients have, you know, subjective improvement in their symptoms, using uh, compression stockings, uh, the sort of short-term compliance uh, is often okay. Uh, Long-term compliance seems to be kind of poor. Elevation is pretty basic. It reduces the orthostatic pressure, improves edema, improves wound healing, um, but uh, 
and often will help with symptoms, but it's really not a durable uh, remedy for uh, varicose veins. Exercise, again, is helpful, um, and this promotes venous return uh, with, uh, and lowers venous pressures uh, when walking. However, frequently, uh, especially in patients with ulcerations, uh, they may have either comorbid conditions which limit their ability to walk, which may contribute to their development of the ulceration. And uh, once they have ulcers, uh, frequently walking can be painful, uh, which can also limit uh, its utility. Uh, so weight loss uh, shows up. Again, this is more, I think, in, in terms of uh, insurance approval issues. Uh, and so I tried to find if there was any, any evidence, uh, not even just good evidence, just uh, evidence to demonstrate that weight loss helps. Uh, I was not able to find much. Um, again, in general, uh, recommending weight loss as a treatment, uh, this is often not that easy. Uh, Long-term compliance is likely poor. And uh, one other thing that I've seen is uh, varicose veins becoming more prominent uh, after uh, bariatric surgery uh, frequently when patients may have loss of some of the surrounding subcutaneous tissue. And, uh, they seem to you know, report they developed the varicose veins. However, I think the varicose veins may have been just not as evident or prominent uh, prior. Uh, so there's some different uh, sort of uh, flea botonics out there. Horse chestnut seed extract is uh, sort of the main one that I routinely will, or not routinely, but will discuss with some patients. And uh, this is available in the United States as a dietary supplement. Uh, as such, it's not that well studied. Um, there's not uh, really long-term safety data about this, uh, but it does seem to improve, or may improve, I should say, venous tone and capillary hyperpermeability. Again, these are, uh, this is a Cochrane review uh, with uh, short-term studies of two to 16 weeks. And really the this is a symptom scoring uh, where very similar symptoms to compression uh, it didn't seem to have as much improvement in the lower leg volume, uh, but uh, uh, overall the really the 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 horse chestnut seed extract had similar results to just uh, recommending compression. And this kind of gets to insurance approval. Uh, most insurance companies are going to require at least three months of failure of conservative measures and they want documentation that they've failed NSAIDs. Uh, fortunately, they haven't, uh, because of the dietary supplement, we don't have to talk about horse chestnut seed extract, but uh, compression is the main, I think, uh, barrier, uh, essentially, to getting these patients treated with uh, an intervention. And so getting on to interventions, again, this is uh, sort of the more interesting part, at least in my opinion, uh, being a surgeon. Uh, so su surgical, there's, uh, Stripping and phlebectomy, uh, then there's um, sort of endovenous thermal uh, treatments, either with laser or radiofrequency ablation, and then there's chemical treatments. And the sort of overarching goal of uh, treatment of varicose or venous insufficiency really is to remove the source of the varicose veins. And so this usually is an incompetent truncal vein uh, or an incompetent perforating vein. And so you want to treat the source, and then uh, a secondary goal is to remove or ablate symptomatic varicose veins. It's sometimes sufficient just to remove the source of the, uh, the varicose veins, which will decrease their pressure and improve their symptoms. Um, and so again, the goal often is to identify the, tr the source, treat the source, uh, and sometimes uh, I'd say it depends on the patient and their symptoms about whether or not uh, sort of secondary treatment of the varicose veins should also be performed at the same time. And so the uh, vein stripping, um, you know, in the United States, I'd say this is mainly historic. Um, I've done, uh, it's been about 10 years since I've done my last uh, vein stripping, and I'm not sure, every once in a while I think about doing one and, and, and still haven't done one. Um, but it's a pretty straightforward procedure. It's uh, it basically, but the problem with it is it's more invasive. It requires general anesthesia, requires two incisions. So you make an incision in the groin, you basically isolate the saphenoid femoral junction, ligate it, uh, you pass this uh, vein stripping device uh, through the vein uh, from an uh, incision at the lower leg, and then the vein is 
forcibly removed. Um, and it's a kind of a, uh, if you've seen this done, it's a pretty um, aggressive uh, problem or procedure. Uh, you know, I was taught that you're supposed to pull the vein stripping device like you're starting a lawnmower. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is not surprisingly more painful with a longer recovery, and this is kind of frequently the, the how the, uh, it looks after this. You'd think there'd be no recurrence after this. You've ligated the saphenofemoral junction, but these patients seem to get, or have a pretty high incidence over time of uh, neo sort of uh, neovascularization and new veins forming um, at the saphenofemoral junction. Uh, so endovenous thermal ablation uh, addresses a lot of the issues that were uh, uh, present from vein stripping. Uh, this has been around for now 30 plus years and really uh, kind of seeks to do uh, what stripping did, but in a much less invasive way. Uh, this is done, can be done with just uh, local and tumescent anesthetic. There's sort of two energy sources available, the radiofrequency ablation, which is what uh, we do here at Abbott Northwestern. Uh, alternative option is um, a laser treatment with uh, endovenous uh, laser therapy. And overall, a uh, number of different papers have um, compared these. Uh, I prefer the rate of frequency ablation in part because there's a much more consistent uh, sort of energy delivery. Uh, you know this, this little, uh, the, the end of the uh, rate of frequency ablation catheter is either three to seven centimeters. You can have the different lengths of the, the uh, heat uh, element. And uh, you know that it's going to heat up to, you know, 120 degrees Celsius for 20 seconds and then you can uh, move this back. With the laser um, uh, treatment, you basically just have a little laser cathode which you put in and you s turn it on and it delivers heat and energy and you sort of have to retract it at a slow, steady pace to um, burn the vein, but you don't wanna do it too slow because then it will deliver too much energy or too fast and not enough potentially. So that's why I think the rate of frequency ablation is a better technique although there's not great evidence to support one over the other. Um, uh, Tumescent anesthetic is really the key to this whole procedure. Uh, this is essentially uh, a uh, Tumescent anesthetic, is normal saline, lidocaine, epinephrine, and sodium bicarbonate. Uh, really the, the main things are the lidocaine for uh, essentially this anesthetic effect, and then epinephrine causes uh, vasoconstriction. You know, frequently uh, a few hundred milliliters of solution are infused, that's why it's important to have the, uh, this is uh, normal saline, you don't wanna, uh, it, and so you can use a lot less uh, lidocaine and, um, with epinephrine, the sodium bicarb is just a buffer the solution. And this provides both anesthesia, it also causes vasospasm, and it provides this essentially heat sink around the, the vein where uh, the heat is confined to the vein and does not, um, is not distributed to the surrounding tissues to reduce the risk for thermal injury to the surrounding tissues. And uh, this is uh, infiltrated under uh, ultrasound guidance, so you basically position your needle right next to the vein and infiltrate all around the veins, and you watch this the whole way up so you can make sure that the vein is uh, adequately anesthetized as well as the surrounding tissues are uh, far enough away from the vein so they're not injured as well. Uh, so the, the risk of uh, thermal ablation really uh, uh, main is either clotting or, or nerve injury. Uh, endovenous heat-induced thrombosis or EHIT is frequently what we talk about, uh, and there are four different types. Kind of depends a little bit on on the extent of this. Essentially, you're trying to get the vein closed and sealed, but you don't want extension of thrombus. Uh, really into the uh, common femoral vein. Um, and so if it extends all the way in, that's a sort of type four, which is a deep vein thrombosis. If it's only in part way, then, you know, we talk about this as a different uh, sort of differentiation between uh, EHIT class uh, two and three. Um, again, these don't tend to behave like DVT, so uh, they're frequently not treated like a DVT unless it's a type four. Uh, nerve injury, um, is uh, the next sort of other always concern uh, with the heat um, elements or the thermal uh, devices. 
And really the saphenous nerve is what we're concerned about. The saphenous nerve is, arises from the femoral nerve and uh, runs in parallel to the saphenous vein. Um, it's sort of variable, uh, but usually from about the mid uh, thigh uh, distally. And the further down, uh, the closer the, the two are. Uh, and so in general, I try to avoid accessing very distally for um, uh, thermal ablation. Recanalization recurrence are also uh, complications. And so the, the sort of newer uh, area of, I'd say, uh, vein treatment is really the non-thermal, non-tumescent um, treatments. Again, because they're non-thermal, they don't need tumescent anesthetic, and that essentially makes uh, it a less invasive procedure, uh, less pain, and uh, there's also, uh, in that, and there's no real risk for injuring the surrounding structures uh, from the heat. Uh, there's uh, sort of three options. Uh, there's a, and these all have sort of um, device manufacturers that, uh, and so the, the names are unfortunately kind of unwieldy uh, if you don't use the device names, but I try to avoid that. So there's mechanical chemical ablation or MOCA. There's chemical adhesive uh, ablation with uh, cyanoacrylate and then uh, polydocal endovenous microfoam or PEM. So this is the cyanoacrylate uh, uh, ablation. Uh, again, this is uh, the cyanoacrylate's a adhesive. Uh, it's a polymer, uh, basically super glue. Uh, and so this is, uh, allows for a single access. Uh, you can access distally in the lower leg as far down as you want, uh, just as there's not as much concern for nerve injury. You don't have to use any tumescent anesthetic. Uh, there is this uh, risk of allergic reaction to the glue or hypersensitivity. And again, this glue, although not a lot of glue is used, it is permanent, so it's, uh, it's sort of an implant. And uh, essentially the, the procedure is, this is kind of what the, the device looks like. It's a little glue gun, there's a little trigger. Every time you push the little trigger, uh, 0.1 cc's of glue is uh, infiltrated and you sort of inject, pull the catheter back, and uh, compress the vein for, uh, to allow it to seal. Uh, again, one of the keys is you gotta move the catheter back because you don't wanna uh, glue the catheter in place. And then there's a, a risk, uh, again, of extension or thrombus extending into the uh, common femoral vein, similar to the, what we see with EVLT and RFA, although probably less, uh, and uh, I think we've started terming this endoluminal uh, glue-induced thrombosis as opposed to the heat-induced thrombosis. There's no heat. So the mechanical chemical ab ablation or MOCA, this is using both combination of a mechanical injury to the vein to cause some vasospasm as well as potentially some endothelial injury. And then at the same time, there's a dispersing sclerosing agent. Uh, and so this is a kind of what the device looks like. It's a little, uh, it's got a little uh, sort of hockey stick catheter that extends out uh, and spins around rapidly, which irritates the vein. Um, this causes both vasospasm as well as potentially some uh, vein endothelial injury. And then the sclerosin is administered uh, to seal the vein. Uh, the, sorry, polydocal, um, uh, microfoam. Uh, this is a sort of foam sclerosant that's used to ablate uh, truncal veins. Again, this is uh, commercially a, a, a available. Uh, there's essentially the catheter uh, is inserted, foam is infused, and uh, then uh, hopefully uh, closes the, um, the vein. And so moving on from sort of treatment of truncal veins to treatment of varicose veins, uh, a surgical phlebectomy is kind of what I prefer for larger veins. I don't really have exactly a size, but it's been mainly more uh, looking at the legs. Uh, so if you can see, uh, this is often what I talk to fellows about, but if you can see the varicose veins and they're quite large and prominent, I think uh, surgical removal is the best approach. If they're somewhat smaller, maybe they're harder to see, uh, even if they potentially are bigger uh, diameters, uh, I think uh, duplex guide sclerotherapy is a better approach. And then for telangiectasias, 
either surface laser or visual square therapy is uh, the best option. This just gets into sort of staph phlebectomies. So the way I do this is using a, like a 16 gauge needle just to make a hole in the skin. And then there's a little, uh, after some blunt dissection, a little hook that is inserted and the vein is pulled out. Uh, Tumescent anesthetic allows for anesthesia of the area so that it doesn't hurt. And then it also allows that there causes the vein to go into vasospasm and vasoconstriction. So when you remove it, it uh, tends to bleed less. Uh, essentially, the, the vein is just avulsed. Uh, we don't uh, ligate it or uh, occasionally I will ligate a vein for various reasons, but in general, uh, just the vein is just removed uh, and discarded. Uh, sclerotherapy, uh, historically hypertonic saline was used, which was quite painful. So sometimes when I've had patients who've had this done 20, 30 years ago and they had a lot of pain with it, uh, this doesn't seem to be a problem with uh, sort of modern uh, sodium tetradecol or polydocanol. And again, this is a uh, a liquid that you can uh, create a foam with uh, using a mixture of uh, sort of a, one, one syringe with air and one syringe with a, uh, sclerosis and, and uh, back and forth um, with a three-way stopcock will create a, a, a foam and the foam is then helpful uh, particularly because it will uh, get better coverage and it can also be tracked uh, using ultrasound uh, while it's being injected. Uh, the main risk with uh, uh, these is really uh, uh, problems with uh, either uh, uh, phlebitis, uh, uh, reaction to this, uh, skin discoloration, or even frank ulceration uh, if uh, sclerosin leaks out and gets into the subcutaneous tissues. Uh, so perforator veins, uh, historically uh, surgical, open surgical ligation was what was recommended. Um, this was a yeah, this is this is definitely historic. Uh, even subfascial uh, seps surgery, I think, is really probably historic. I've never seen one. Uh, I think, Dr. Skake, you've probably seen a seps or two. Yeah, Levitsky, yep. Levitsky. Levitsky uh, but they were uh, basically it's a sort of like using almost like a laparoscopic setup to uh, open up the subfascial plane and ligate these, but. Again, I think uh, some of the newer techniques, less invasive, uh, in, in, I tend to use a, a duplex guide sclerotherapy to treat these. Uh, alternative options are uh, either a laser uh, therapy or RFA devices are available to uh, treat uh, small perforating veins. And this kind of goes into uh, some different uh, sort of comparisons of these. Again, uh, I think RFA and EVLT are very similar, uh, very good for treating the truncal veins as well as potentially for uh, incompetent perforating veins. Uh, one of the things that's required for treatment of these veins is that the veins be not too tortuous. Uh, essentially, truncal veins should be straight. Uh, if they're tortuous, they're probably a, a varicose vein arising from the, um, uh, the vein, and so uh, sometimes recurrent varicose veins uh, may look like a, like a saphenous vein because they're running the same distribution or maybe they're an accessory. But if they're tortuous, it really makes these devices challenging because the devices are long, straight catheters. And if, if they, you can use wires and things to try to negotiate, but there's only sort of so much, uh, sometimes it's just not able to get the, device, you know, the catheter in place, in which case that limits their use. They do require to mescence, uh, and there's a risk of, besides the E-hit, there's also a risk of nerve injury. Um, cyanoacrylate glue uh, is nice because it doesn't have uh, to mescent anesthetic. Uh, there's, you know, the, actually the company does recommend, or does not recommend that compression be used post-procedure. However, I tend to um, still be a little worried, and so I actually tend to recommend my patients uh, still do some compression just to try to get the maximum benefit of the procedure. Uh, probably not as good for large uh, veins, um, so uh, less than 10 millimeters is the IFU. Uh, and again, the issues mainly are either a hypersensitivity to skin, um, or sorry, hypersensitive, sorry, a reaction to the glue, um, and or phlebitis. And uh, then the, the last two are really more duplex, uh, or sorry, just kind of different ways of 
administering uh, a sclerosant. So uh, MOCA is delivering sclerosant with the added benefit of this uh, sort of whipping, um, spinning uh, metal uh, hockey stick thing. And uh, again, it really, it, it, you can negotiate some tortuosity, but uh, it has, uh, that's one of its limitations is it's just, if it, the vein's too tortuous, you may not be able to get the device in place. Uh, one of the benefits to it may be that uh, when you're infusing this uh, sclerosin, it can uh, diffuse into the side branches. Uh, and really the reactions, again, are kind of this, essentially the same thing for all sclerotherapy, which is skin discoloration, thrombophobitis, uh, or in rare cases, ulceration. Ulceration should be less common with these procedures because in general, the, the, especially the truncal veins, if you're treating these, it really, you know, less likely to have the extravasation that you may get with uh, more superficial venous uh, injections. And again, uh, their size uh, less than 12 or less than 10. And again, I think that there's not as much of that for the radiofrequency or laser treatment. However, uh, really large veins may, better, may be better treated with Stripping, however, like I said before, I haven't done that in a number of years. Uh, but that's really probably where stripping is still uh, indicated. And so uh, really the indications for treatment are symptomatic varicose veins that are not responsive to conservative measures, uh, uh, c 2 disease, uh, and then um, uh, venous ulcerations, either seep c 6 or uh, healed ulcers, which is seep c 5 and that's to prevent recurrence. I think wound healing and venous stasis skin changes are kind of the two areas where it's not as clear. Uh, this is a little bit older trial now, um, but this uh, was a randomized trial for surgery, uh, so stripping uh, versus compression. And this trial showed no benefit in wound healing, and this is kind of often uh, used as sort of showing that there's really not great data to support surgery to uh, promote wound healing. However, if you look at uh, surgery and compression versus compression alone in terms of recurrence, there's significantly improved, uh, um, imp sorry, there's statistically more recurrence in the compression alone, and that's why uh, vein surgery to treat uh, patients with venous ulcers is, uh, was recommended. This is a little bit newer uh, study, and this demonstrates really that uh, this was so. This was uh, really endovenous interventions, and it was a, a, a mix of different things: foam sclerotherapy, ablation with uh, thermal ablation. Uh, also, they had a couple patients, or a few percent, with MOCA, and then some uh, combination of these. Uh, and really, the this again was a randomized trial, again out of the UK, uh, and this showed in a benefit uh, in uh, reducing the median time to ulcer healing from, 50, from 82 days with the delayed intervention group or deferred intervention to early, with uh, 56 days with early intervention. So there is some evidence for improvement, um, you know, whether or not this is because of better venous therapies or um, is because the old trial really was with uh, stripping. I think it's uh, still not completely clear. This is just kind of a, a summary of some pivotal studies. Uh, really, you know, pretty good uh, closure rates have been reported for all of the uh, rate of frequency ablation, laser, uh, cyanoacrylate glue, and MOCA. Um, although my, my experience with MOCA was not nearly as good as the 96%. And then uh, foam has a significantly lower uh, rate of a closure, and that kind of is seen here with the immediate occlusion, a higher rate of recanalization at three years. Um, however, there's sort of a higher rate of recurrence among all the uh, modalities. And again, the I think the sort of initial complications, uh, you know, sort of immediate failure. Um, you know, I think the you know the the foam is significantly higher. Uh, probably more risk of phlebitis with that, uh, but uh, the non-thermal non-tumescents have no real risk of uh, thermal injury. Uh, so there's a lot of different treatment options out there. I uh, frequently tend to, especially when I'm treating uh, symptomatic varicose veins, try to combine uh, rate of frequency ablation and stab phlebectomies. Uh, one of the reasons I do this is that if you're 
using, if you're treating uh, the varicose veins with uh, tumescent anesthetic, you're already going to be infusing tumescent anesthetic, then I think that reduces the benefit of the non-thermal, non-tumescent uh, interventions. And so that's my standard. Uh, I usually use cyanoacrylate ablation. If the patients have ulcers um, or if they have a reason to avoid uh, tumescent anesthetic, uh, frequently like needle phobia or just uh, want a less invasive procedure. And then uh, I think sclerotherapy really uh, for, so for recurrent varicose veins, again, big recurrent varicose veins, often staphylobectomy, sclerotherapy for uh, smaller ones or uh, concomitant uh, treatment of perforating veins. And then just uh, for, you know, referring practitioners, uh, if, if the patients are really asymptomatic and the varicose veins aren't bothering them, probably the best thing to do is uh, nothing. If they're uh, symptomatic, uh, then I think the best option is to prescribe them compression stockings, 20 to 30, milligram, 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury, and uh, then refer. That's uh, interesting is some societies that recommend against providing compression, just referral alone because of the poor evidence uh, for compression. But unfortunately, science and insurance approval are not the same. And so uh, the sooner they get compression stockings and start trying them, the sooner that sort of three-month uh, clock potentially can start clicking and uh, uh, potentially get them treated sooner. And then again, if there's more advanced signs of venous insufficiency, skin changes, ulcers, then I think they should be referred. That's all. Any questions? Dr. Lesser. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. That's comprehensible even to a non-vascular surgeon. Thank you. I, how often, because of the high frequency of sleep apnea and obesity, how often do you look for a concomitant uh, reason why someone may develop a demeanor and skin changes that's central as opposed to just uh, what? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's one of the things that's... Uh, you know, particularly for edema, uh, I think edema for, you know, I, I really actually try almost never to intervene upon uh, patients for edema. Uh, so although it's in the C classifications, I tend to think there's too many reasons for someone to have edema. And so if you just treat their, maybe they have an incompetent staph in his vein, I don't think they actually, or in general, not always, but you know, you, you sort of want to make sure there's not some other underlying etiology, you know, and if there is, you know, then I tend to try to avoid that, you know, and really recommend more kind of conservative measures, compression, elevation uh, for swelling. And, uh, you know, I think, yeah, further evaluation, if there is concern for sleep apnea or some heart issues, um, sometimes you'll see in a, a venous duplex, uh, essentially like a sort of pulse tile waveforms in the uh, femoral veins, which, you know, could be sign of some, maybe some right heart failure. And, uh, you know, then I'd, I think those patients should be definitely evaluated further. Um, I, I, I think, uh, but yeah, I think the, you know, I think often, you know, you, and, and sometimes with, you know, if they do have heart disease, I sometimes I'm a little reluctant to, you know, treat their uh, saphenous vein because, you know, depending on it, it may be what they need for their coronary bypass, or if they have peripheral vascular disease, maybe for their, uh, you know, leg bypass. Uh, so I, but again, I, uh, so I, I do frequently kind of think about that, um, but that's almost more what I'm often thinking about. Uh, but, you know, do the, if the symptom, if they're symptomatic and it really makes sense that what, you know, their symptoms are, um, you know, even if they do have some, maybe right heart failure, or maybe they have some central you know, sleep apnea or something, you know, again, they're often going to have benefit to treatment of their varicose veins. So if that's what's bothering them frequently, I'll recommend treatment unless, you know, I'm really worried they're going to need a uh, coronary bypass soon or some other intervention on their heart. Sure. Thank, thank you, Elliot, for that. Really, uh, I've always been puzzled by the, the skin changes and the alterations and what, what the mechanism of that. I know you started out by saying that we don't know that, but, mm -hmm. you know, the, the discoloration, I assume, is that hemocerin that's uh, there, and does that have anything to do with the skin the breakdown or? Yeah, I mean, there's some, you know, I mean, there's, there's like a fair amount of, um, you know, basic science that has kind of been done with this sort of inflammatory cascade and uh, hyperpermeability of the capillaries and sort of vascular leak and, uh, unfortunately, it's not, you know, I think what's one of the challenges, you know, as a sort of 
practicing clinician, uh, is really trying to predict. You know, so some patients will get varicose veins, you know, really bad. I mean, huge varicose veins, and they will have no skin changes. Other patients will get really skin changes without, you know, an obvious, you know, their veins don't look that bad on ultrasound. Um, you know, and then some patients will have skin changes and no ulceration, and others will get ulceration. And sort of why it's not clear that, you know, if you have, you know, an incompetent saphenous vein, you know, and, and it's not treated, you're going to eventually lead to sort of more kind of, you know, and so I think that's really where this idea of, you know, it's the venous hemodynamics, you know, I think is a simplification of a really complicated biological symptom, system that we don't probably understand that well. Um, you know, people have tried some different um, medications over the years to see if, you know, the, that would, uh, if that would have any remedy. Uh, you know, I think compression stockings definitely, I mean, there's definitely a pressure component to this. So, I mean, wound healing really requires compression. You know, without compression, it doesn't matter what sort of intervention we do on their veins, they're not going to heal their wounds. Um, and so I think it's, I think it's complicated. And, you know, and again, that little cartoon is, you know, like even at the bottom, they kind of talk about, like a lot of these steps are sort of speculative. They're, they're sort of assume that, you know, this leads to this leads to this, but it exactly where and why, you know, somebody does, you know, gets a problem. And that's one of the reasons I think skin changes, if you see someone's skin changes, it's hard to predict if that person is going to go on to ulceration in the future or not. Uh, you know, and should you be, you know, real aggressive early with intervention or should you watch and see? I think it's, it's, it's really tricky to say because I'm always a little reluctant to do a procedure with potential risks if I can't really say, okay, well, you've got a 30% chance of, a, you know, if you're getting an ulcer in the future. If you did, you know, that's probably worth doing. If it's a 2% risk, well, maybe, you know, now that now the risk is probably higher for the procedure. That's okay. Just a common, uh, common sense to great presentation. So, um, so you know, different techniques that we keep doing, and I kind of see like the tenacrylate, you know, the chemotherapy mobilization. Don't you think it's kind of fast to recovery since we don't put the mesenchymal anesthesia and, uh, you know, so you like this technique also, or? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think um, I've had a couple of, uh, you know, I think it's, I don't, I don't always think it's as straightforward. Uh, sometimes I've had, um, where sometimes patients do have some fair amount of discomfort with the cyanoracolate. Um, you know, I do think, you know, especially for ulceration, uh, you know, not having to infiltrate a whole bunch of tumescent, potentially causing some injury to the subcutaneous tissues, you know, I think it actually makes a lot of sense. So I think for, you know, that's why for ulcers, I think cyanoracrylate ablation is kind of really, um, in general, a lot of times I'm doing the concomitant um, RFA, I mean, sorry, staphylbectomy at the same time, and so therefore I'm always, I'm not sure how much benefit, if I'm already infiltrating a bunch of tumescent anesthetic in the leg, I'm not sure how much I sort of save, so that's one of the reasons I, I you know, and again, I'm always a little concerned about leaving super glue in someone's leg forever, and so I, I think, it's, so I think for, but I do think for, yeah, for like, you know, if it's more straightforward, just saphenous incompetence, or especially small saphenous, um, where the sural nerve can be in, affected, you know, I think it's kind of a nice procedure, so I think, you know, and again, I, I didn't, have the greatest success with MOCA, uh, and then the PEM technique is really a little tricky because uh, low dextroscape got it approved on formulae for us. You have to do so many procedures a month to make it financially um, because it's basically a drug. Uh, you have to buy it from the company, and it, it, to make it actually work financially, you have to have you know X number of procedures. And just to the comment to the question of Dr. Lesser, you know, I've diagnosed a lot of heart failure and sleep apnea, and he's kind of probably. <laughs> Uh, patients, and I've seen a lot of patients on even calcium channel blockers with edema, and then they refer to us with vein disease. And it's very hard sometimes to promise, oh, when we close your vein, and if you have concurrent heart failure, like Dr. Stevenson said, you can't promise that this is going to get better because you have to treat the underlying other comorbidities, like if they have lymph edema, you know, calcium channel block complications, right, heart, uh, uh, heart failure, and so forth. So, yeah, so good with you. And obesity, I think, is a big obesity also a big problem. Feeling. In terms of swelling and okay, thank you, thank you.